Yeah, awesome. Hey, everybody. I'm Justin. Um, I'm with Mapbox Talmel. I'm going to show you it and talk about it. Uh, I mentioned as people were coming in, about half of it's going to be some slides, just as an orientation, maybe a little less if I can get through it a little quicker. And then the rest is going to be a live demo, which you can follow along with. Um, and I should also mention up front for anybody who missed it, if you go here, this will take you to a GitHub repo that has both these slides as well as some source data files that you can grab while I'm talking if you want to follow along in real time and kind of fiddle around with Tom Mill and make a map yourself. So you want to get whatever you can grab off of that, the smaller stuff onto the larger stuff, it'll download for you now. And you want to go to tilemill.com and get the, get the app if you want to follow along. You don't need to. I'm going to show a demo and everything. But if you do want to play around now or later, you can do that. Um, so yeah, uh, quick bit about me. I work for Mapbox. Uh, I'm here in Portland along with one other guy now. Uh, most of the crew is in Washington, DC. And we have a bunch of remote folks. Um, I don't have a traditional GIS background, so uh, I'm a bit of a newbie to making maps. So I apologize if I make any cartographers cry, because I'm not really a, a visual artist. But I know the code stuff and how to make it work, so that's what I'm going to show you today. And, and hopefully, if you're interested in making maps, enable you to, to do much better looking things than what I can put together. Um, mostly what I do is iOS dev, uh, open source code for iPad and the iPhone. And um, I've been doing a, uh, putting out open source code close to 15 years or so, largely in PHP and Bash and stuff like that before. But last five years or so, a lot of Cocoa iOS uh, Objective-C code. Uh, Mapbox, if you're not familiar with us, uh, we're basically a company that is trying to build an ecosystem around fast, beautiful maps, tools to make them, and ways to host them, and otherwise do things with maps that look good. What we do charge for is cloud hosting, high availability of maps. So if you want to embed maps in a high traffic website or use them in a high volume app or something like that, that's what you could pay us for if you don't want to do it yourself. Um, but everything else that we do, including all the code that I work on, is open source in a BSD or MIT license, depending. Meaning um, you can use it in your own uh, projects of any sort. Um, which is it's a, it's a kind of a cool model, and I'm really happy that I'm able to do it because I work on entirely open source code. Um, and we have a lot of repos up on GitHub if you go to GitHub slash Mapbox at current count, 116 public repos of code. And, and these, I should mention, are our core libraries, things like TileMill itself, um, that are entirely open source. So it's not just example code that works with our stuff, but it's our stack. Um, so what we're here to do today is make a, a custom map. And I'll show you how to do that after a little bit of orientation as to why TileMill and why it exists and how you use it. But um, the topic I picked is food carts here in Portland because we have a lot of them. We have about uh, 500 licensed food carts. So I thought it'd be fun to make a map of that, uh, along with some things like the streets to get to them, transit to get there, parks nearby in case you want to take your food and enjoy it in the park, ATMs in case you're short on cash. We'll put all these on our, our map that I make later. Um, the map that I make can also work on mobile in a couple different ways, either through HTML or I'll show you a quick demo how it interacts with the stuff that I work on on native iOS code. Um, it's interactive. You'll be able to hover over parts of the map and, and have things come up. And um, it's offline capable. And I'll explain kind of how that works and, and how Tilemill can help you do that sort of thing. But that's essentially what I'm going to make in the second half. So Tilemill um, can chew through pretty much any major type of geographic data. And so um, probably the most common you'll run across is something called a shapefile, which was put out by Esri. Um, it's, a, it's a vector format, so it can describe anything from points to lines to borders. Of, of particular things. Um, as an example, say Oregon State um, GIS, or various departments in Oregon State put out data files that map every body of water, or town boundaries, or things like that. They frequently do that in shape files. There's also GeoJSON, which is just a, a loose kind of standard around JSON um, plain text that can represent points and lines and polygons and things like that. KML is another popular one, which you might know of being associated with um, Google Earth. Um, it's kind of an, it's an XML-based format. It's kind of sprawly. I mentioned that because it's got a lot of parts that only really work well in, in Google Earth. But you can still represent some basic things with it. And, and it's pretty interchangeable with a lot of other programs, including TileMill. Um, there are rasters, which are generally in GeoTIFF, which is a specialized kind of TIFF format. So a raster being like a 2D image, maybe a satellite picture that you stick on top of a map, versus a vector that describes um, lines or points or things like that. Um, I'm not going to use that directly in the, in the map that I make, but a good example would be satellite imagery or aerial imagery or a printed map that you want to put into a web map or something like that. Um, 
and then OpenStreetMap data. Um, this is what we use in building our worldwide maps, which, by the way, we use Tilemill for. So there's no like secret tool we're building our world map with. We're also using Tilemill. Um, and so it, comes, it can come in a binary format, an XML format. I'm not going to get into that because that's large even at a city level. It gets to be a very large data set, but that's the kind of data you'd pull in if you wanted to make a whole map of the city or a whole map of the world. Um, another common one that Tilemill works with is SQLite, which is just a simple file-based relational database. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be geodata. You can join that. You can use Tilemill to join that with other data, including from something like a CSV export from a spreadsheet. Um, and lastly, another popular, more heavy-duty database is called PostGIS, which is uh, a suite built around Postgres, uh, Postgres database, which is a full-on relational database. PostGIS has um, lots of things for doing uh, geo-related queries in it. So that works with Tilemill as well. So these are kind of the, some of the more popular formats of data that you'll either find or that you could make. Probably the easiest one to make from scratch is something like GeoJSON and a text editor. Um, and I'll show you a bit of what, uh, I'm mostly using shapefiles in my demo just because I'm using public data sources that are a little more complex that I did not write myself. But um, the carts itself comes from XML, or KML, so I'll show you that. Um, just a note on some places to get data and a nod to where I got my data, although I do call that out as well in the, the repo link that I mentioned before. For anybody, again, who missed it, it's um, tinyurl.com slash tommel. That'll take you to the GitHub repo if you want to browse that. There's a sources file in there where I list where my data sources that I'm going to use came from and where you can get them if you want to re-download them. Um, so a lot of open government uh, data sources. CivicApps.org is the great source here in Portland um, for getting uh, things related like city boundaries, neighborhoods, streets, sidewalks, even those little horse rings that are on the sidewalks, if you've ever seen those. Um, Developer.trimat.org has a lot of great data around anything related to the rail or bus system. Um, you can create your own, like I mentioned. GeoJSON is probably the easiest to do this with. Um, KML, uh, you can also do. That's essentially text, although it's XML, so you have to make sure. I mean, you have to make sure GeoJSON parses as well, but um, XML is a little more verbose to write. And um, the cart data I pulled from a website called foodcartsportland.com. They have a map. You can click on it and go, and I mentioned this again in the sources file. You can go to a Google-hosted map. And on there, there's a download link for a KML export. And they've just got points. And so that's what I'm using for my point data in the, the map I'm going to build. Um, I also want to give a couple uh, shout outs to some geo utilities that are open source that are great. Um, I'll show you one. GDAL is more of a command line kind of tool used for converting things from one format to another. Sometimes pronounced Google, GDAL. G, G -D -A -L. Um, it's great for manipulating any kinds of uh, geo data you might have. The other one, which I'll show you briefly, is called Quantum GIS or QGIS. Um, it's kind of a whole desktop system that you can use. And it's particularly useful if you want to look at a shape file, that first file format I mentioned, because they're often large. Like I have a, one of the sources I've pulled in is a, the body of water or stream data for the entire state. And so it's got a lot of vectors in it. It's got every, every piece of water that's been mapped. And you can open it pretty quickly in, in QGIS and get a visual of what it looks like. Um, so Tilemill, you came here to, to learn about Tilemill, and that kind of sets the stage a bit, so I'll, I'll kind of dive right into it now. Tilemill is a geographic design studio that we wrote to kind of scratch our own itch, and like I said, we use it for our world map, and um, lots of folks use it to, to build custom maps. Um, it is BSD licensed and entirely open source. The, the project lives in one repo. It's GitHub slash Mapbox slash Tilemill, so every, all the work you see happen there. Um, it's written, just as a side note, in Node.js. Uh, on the desktop, it's actually a client server that runs on your desktop. So whenever you install it, it you can also go to it in a browser. But in the pre-distributed binaries that we put together, we put a browser there. So it opens as kind of a desktop app with its own browser talking to itself. And it looks like a desktop app, as you'll see. Um, and it also, uh, by virtue of the fact of it being based on Node and being essentially a web app, it runs on Linux, Mac, and Windows. And we've got pre-built versions for all those. And again, I'm just going to overemphasize the, the link in case you want to download it along while I'm talking. That's at tilemill.com. That'll redirect you to uh, the part on our site where you can download that, um, a pre-built version. Oh, and I put the link in here. That tilemill.com goes to that. Same thing, mapbox.com slash tilemill. Um, what it looks like is this. It's got a split window, so it doesn't look like a browser. You, know, you don't have an address bar or anything. You basically, you've got your map over on the left side that you're working on, your layers of your map, and over here, a code editor. And this is where you're styling 
the part, you pull in the, the various layers of your data in the bottom left, and then you, you target them and style them over here, kind of akin to um, writing CSS. Uh, and so that language is called Cardo CSS, and it's like CSS, basically. You kind of, you target um, various layers, uh, similar to how you target a div when you're writing CSS in HTML. And then we've got a whole language of things like line width, line opacity, polygon, line width, polygon, shape, uh, pattern fill, um, text labels, things like that. And you can do some conditionals, you can pull in fonts, you can pull in fields from your tabular data. Um, and then a lot of things related to color and line widths and opacity and stuff like that. And so you style this in real time. And uh, every time you hit save, hit the save button or the, the keyboard command for it, the map in the left side of the app refreshes immediately. And so uh, you will see your styles apply and you're able to change your map just like you were changing an HTML and CSS website. But it is actually rendering out at a multiple zoom level map full of tiles and an interactive map in the left hand side. Um, we have a full reference for it online, which is also available in the app. I'll show you that. It's at mapbox.com slash cardo. And the parsers and all the stuff for that are open source as well. But um, it, it breaks things down by what are called symbolizers. So if you're de dealing with text, you use text dash blah, lines or line dash blah, polygons, um, markers, rasters. Each, each type of visual that you're working with in Talmel has uh, uh, what's called a symbolizer, and, and you kind of target it. So I'm targeting line width, text name, text face name, line width, line width, that sort of thing. Um, and it allows for real-time editing of all the features. Um, another quick uh, side note about, so how does stuff come out of Tile Mill? Some of the problems you have when you have a, a multiple zoom level map um, that's, that's made up of tiles are you've got uh, size, you've got a, a quantity of these tiles. And I'll explain in a minute for anybody who's not familiar how tiles fit together to make a map and why, why we do it that way. But when you've got a bunch of tiles making up that are being stitched together in the browser or in the app to display a map, some of the problems you run into are the size of, of the resulting map or the, the collection of tiles. You want to have a good ease of transfer and, and transferring potentially thousands or millions of tiles if you're covering the whole world. Um, robustness, so that when you transfer those, you don't lose tiles along the way if you need to sync them between different servers and stuff like that, or put them onto a mobile device over USB or Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or whatever. And you want some way to make this work in, in multiple, uh, multiple platforms. And so map tiles uh, let you do this, uh, but also create some of their own problems. So th this is the way the map, uh, if you have a, have a given map, this is a particular zoom level. If we zoom in, it's another zoom level. If we zoom back out, it's another zoom level. But at a given zoom level, it's broken up into tiles that are generally 256 pixels square. And so this, what, this is what makes up a map that you see in a browser or in most apps. And um, the problem is, once you, I mean, this is great if we're looking at all of Europe like this. This is maybe one, two, like five, 15, 20 tiles. But the problem is, as you get into any kind of useful area where you zoom in at a higher level of detail, they can easily number in the millions. And, and the reason this, this happens is at zoom level zero, you have one tile, one 256 pixel tile. It represents the whole planet. When you zoom in from there, you get each tile changes into four more tiles. Um, so it's always four to the power of whatever zoom level you're in. So then when you get down to zoom level 17, which is like here's a building and a block in Portland, so like four blocks, that's zoom level 17, there's four to the 17th tiles to be dealt with. And so at any point in between there, you're, you're generally dealing with a large number of these tiles. And they become difficult to transfer reliably and to make sure that you've got them all. And so what Tile Mill does with these tiles that it makes is put them into a format that we came up with called MB Tiles. Um, and it's just a single file that lets you transfer these tiles around. And the, and the way it does that is um, it, it originated from this scale problem of trying to figure out how to transport even, even 100,000 tiles. It's a pain when you've got 100,000 PNG images in a folder system and you need to zip them or transfer them or whatever. Um, and it's a big pain on mobile, like I mentioned, when you're trying to transfer it over USB or network or something like that. And so all MB Tiles is is, uh, is SQLite, um, a SQLite database with the images stuffed into it. So in each of those tiles, you've got the zoom level, which is the Z, and then you've got a cross and down, which are the X and the Y part of the tiles. So you've got a row that can be identified by Z, X, Y, and then it's got an image associated with it. And we just stick that image right in the database as a row as well. And so this is the format that um, Tilemail exports to. And this being a kind of a simple open format, we also have tools 
command line tools and otherwise if you want to get them back out into a file system or take a file system of images that you already have or you've pulled down from somewhere and get those into an MB tiles file. Yeah. Okay. Let me know if it comes up again. Um, yeah, so, so essentially tilemail will output into this and then if you upload it to our hosting, we just upload that file. It makes it a lot easier than trying to say rsync 100,000 tiles or something like that. So just to kind of lay the groundwork, that's what tilemail outputs, but you can get your stuff back out if you want to use it. If you want to self-host, you want to use it on any other mapping system. Um, it's, it's a pretty transparent format. Um, and I link that as well from the GitHub repo in the readme where you can read more about it. We also got another table in there about uh, things related to like what zoom levels does this map cover, where does this map belong, what's the title of the map, stuff like that. And optimizations, things like if you think about it, if you've got a world map, a lot of the tiles are going to be blue ocean. So you can get rid of all those and point all those rows at one ocean tile and save a lot of space. So tilemail does all that kind of stuff automatically. Yeah. So this is a, a rasterized view of the database? It is, yeah. So it take, the question is this is a rasterized view. Tilemail, what tilemail does in its current incarnation, we're working on a, on a vector version of tilemail too, but what I'm going to show you, the stable version, takes possibly vector sources like shapefiles or GeoJSON or KML and possibly raster sources like satellite imagery and makes these raster tiles, these PNG images, out of it and then lets you host those for use in a, in a browser or, or an app. Um, and so once you've kind of boiled those down, you've got the tiles and you can't deduce the source data back out of it, but uh, that's just not what this is designed for. This is designed for taking a bunch of data, boiling it down into tiles that are easy to, to turn into a map and communicate with people. And just the mobile aspect of this is you know, we, like I mentioned, we use these MB tiles files for serving. You upload those into our hosting. You can use an open source Python server called TileStash that supports it. There's some others. That's probably the most popular one if you want to self-host straight out of these. But also for offline use, because you've got all this stuff in one file, it's really easy to transfer and talk to it directly. And some of the stuff that I work on with, with our mobile tools, our iOS SDK, that can just reach right into that database and serve the tiles up. So even if it doesn't have a network connection, if it knows it needs these six tiles to fill the screen, instead of going to get them from the net, it can reach into the MB tiles, pull the right six tiles out, and stitch those up. Uh, we don't directly have an Android SDK. There's some good libraries that support it, OSM Droid. Uh, Nudetech is a, is a closed source SDK that supports it. Um, it's something we're kind of still debating and working on. We don't have like a full support for it yet. And, and my personal expertise is in iOS, which is why I'm working on this bit. But um, I can point you to some resources directly afterwards. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the groundwork. I kind of blew through it a little bit. Again, feel free to stop me if you have any questions, but I'm mostly going to get into the demo part and show you. Yeah. Um, so with that volume of uh, image data in a SQL database, do you get any memory performance issues as opposed to when they're using a bigger file format? Uh, so the question is, having that many tiles in a database, do so you hit any performance or memory issues? Not in my experience. SQLite is pretty efficient at being able to just serve the ones that, it, that you need at the time. Um, the, the adapter, say, that I wrote for iOS just maintains a persistent connection and just grabs tiles as it needs it. The whole point of this tiling scheme is that when a certain area scrolls off the map or zooms out of range, the graphical side of things kind of discards that. Browsers do it with JavaScript libraries. Um, native clients do it. And then that's because when you have, uh, you know, 17 billion tiles for zoom level 17, that's because you're zoomed in. You go many, many millions of pixels in all directions, and that's why it's tiled. So, yeah, question? Uh, Yeah, so the question is, is the database spatial light or anything else? It's just straight SQL light. Spatial light is, a, is an extension you can load into a SQL light database that does GIS kind of queries like intersecting regions and is a point inside a circle and stuff like that. We don't really need any of that. This is a straight, almost like a key value store. The key is the X, Y, Z, what zoom level, how far across and down are we, and the value is the the blob that we're going to turn into an image to make a tile. So it's super, super simple. And the reason I started with that is because when I was doing it on iOS, you couldn't bring in, you couldn't easily dynamically load extensions. And you just don't need it for this sort of thing. It's pretty straightforward. So I'll grab my chair and I'll pop open tile mill and start showing you what it looks like. Um, yeah, so when you launch tile mill, um, it launches, like I mentioned, as a desktop app. Oh, you need to see that. Uh, let's see. So I'm here now. Okay. So, okay. So when you launch it, it launches as a desktop app. 
And although it matters less on a small projected screen like this, I like to run it in full screen mode. So don't be freaked out if it looks different than yours. I kind of make the top stuff disappear. I don't use that much. Um, I've got a ton of projects in here. If you launch it, you'll generally have, I think, three demo projects to start for. But yeah, it's, it's pretty minimal. But um, basically, you, you make a new project by hitting the New Project button. You give it a file name. Like I'll call it Sample. Call it Sample Map. And when you're first starting out, it's useful to keep this box checked, which automatically pulls in a shape file that Tom L. ships with. It has the border of every country in the world. And so it kind of gives you your bearings. If you don't include that by default, you have a blank canvas to work with, which is great if you know what you're doing. But if you don't, it's blank and you start styling things at the local level and you can't see it because you're looking at the whole planet. So generally leave that on. And what you get by default, once it starts the project, well, it adds it. Uh, and then sample map. And then when you go to it, you get that data file illustrated at a very basic level. Um, and so this, this bit down here in the, the very bottom left of the, the leftmost sidebar over there is the layers UI. And that is where you add various layers of your map and you kind of drag reorder them. If you want to have, say, town dots on top of country polygons, you'd drag the towns on top. And so to add, let me show you re-adding um, re a layer to start. So let me delete the one that's here. You go to add a fresh layer. I should, I should save it. So you have nothing by default. I'll clear this out as well. Oops. Wrong key. Um, clear this guy. Country, I believe the country layer is still there, though. Um, until you hit save up in the top right, which is Control or Command S, that will, um, that will make the change. So a as a default, you have this kind of map uh, target, which just targets the background. And then you can use hex codes or keywords on it, like black or F00 for red, things like that. Uh, like I said, it's going to be a really ugly map to start. But the one, I do have one prepared that looks nice in the end. I'm going to switch over to that in a minute, but just to kind of show you a blank canvas of what it looks like. Um, so that's not a bad color. That's kind of, let's do this. So red. So to re-add a layer, you go down to Layers UI, you add a layer. And the only thing you really need is your data source here and you can browse your local file system. Or um, you, can, you can go to this center tab, Mapbox, and that is some online HTTP-based resources. So we have a data set called Natural Earth, which has lots of things like um, cultural boundaries, like cities and counties and things like that, and physical boundaries like uh, oceans and lakes and reefs. So if I go back up, I'll, do, I'll bring in this country layer again, the cultural one. Just grab the countries file. This pulls down the zip file and everything you need. Uh, they are, yeah. It's shapefile and the, the files that kind of go along with a .shp. Um, so they can refer to remote sources, or you can browse a local source, which I'll show you in a minute. And I'll call this, again, countries. And all you really need is where the data is coming from and the ID. And this is similar to the ID in HTML and CSS, how I'm going to target it. And once you've got that, you can hit Save to just add it to the map without any visuals. Or you can hit Save in Style, and that will put in some boilerplate code that determines, OK, this is a this is a file of polygons, so I should, make, I should give them a border and a fill color. Or it's a, it's a file of dots, and so I should put markers on the map. And so it kind of gives you a guideline. Again, if you just hit Save, you won't see anything. If you hit Save in Style, it threw in this little bit here that targets pound countries and gives it a random line color, line width, polygon opacity, polygon fill. So I can start to change these things right off. Change the countries black, make the line 10 pixel. Mm, this is going to look terrible, but yellow, whatever. <laughs> that sort of thing. A map, yes. Um, yeah, so you get the idea. I mean, this is basically how you work with pretty much any kind of common database format. And so to add a second layer, you know, I go into the Add Layer, I browse. I'll go again to the Mapbox tab and just grab something from online to start with. I'll do, um, oh, I don't know, provinces, states and provinces. We have one of those somewhere. States, provinces, this guy. I'll call it states, save and style that. Takes a minute, but now they're all filled in, in in this color, which could be blue, that sort of thing. Um, oh, sorry, that was the line color. Is there any states and provinces shift? Yeah, states and provinces .shp .zip. What's the states and provinces why? Uh, I'm not positive offhand. I usually use this one. Um, I'm going to get down to the local level in a minute, which I have data that I do know. This stuff I, I mostly don't use at the global level. But basic idea is um, 
I'm dragging things around and I can reorder the layers here. And you can see these are both indicated as polygon layers. Tom they'll kind of figured out that they're shapes, so you know how to target them and you're going to use lines and polygons. And I mentioned also that Tile Mill has a Cardo reference in it. That's the second tab up in the bottom left. You've got layers, and then the little brackets are the Cardo reference, conveniently located right next to your editor. And so these are all your symbolizers. So if you're dealing with polygons or lines or points, and they've got all the options listed out. So polygons can have a fill, an opacity, a gamma, gamma method, smoothing. There's polygon patterns you can fill in with different, um, you can tile an image inside of a border, things like that. Um, so the basic idea is you can just kind of pull from this and start editing on this side, hitting save, save button being up here, by the way, or use the keyboard shortcut and see the changes in real time. And one other neat thing you can kind of do, which I don't get into too much in the food carts map that I'm going to show you, but in any of your data here, this leftmost part of the, of the layers row for it is a, is a tabular data browser. So in the case of countries, this is all the data contained in the shape file um, in a kind of a tabular format. So they have country names, which you can use for labeling. They have um, abbreviations that you could use maybe for tool tips or things like that. So I can also target. Correct, yeah. It's all the various properties, everything except the geo parts, which are just interpreted by tile mill and used to actually draw the thing. So let me jump back out here, delete the states markup. I'm going to leave states in here for now. But if I don't have any markup for it, when I save, it goes away, and we're back to black and yellow countries. Is it me? I don't know. Maybe try the other one. Well, if, you, if you've got the stuff from the GitHub repo, um, I'm going to get to the local data in a second. We'll, we'll work with that. Because it, it's generally, as you'd imagine, faster. I mean, it's cached um, after it's pulled down the first time if you're doing one of those remote ones, but then it's, then it's on your file system. Yeah, question. Um, so does this come with different projections of Earth? Like, I noticed this one makes Greenland look incredibly large. Right. So yes, Tile Mill currently works with one projection. It can be adapted, and we've got some guides online for doing, for example, people have mapped Antarctica, which, as you can imagine, gets quite distorted by this map. This, this is a projection called Spherical Mercator, which is what's used by Google Maps, Bing Maps, Mapbox Maps, pretty much any kind of web maps. Um, mostly just due to kind of historical reasons in the way it's easily tiled and, and divvied up. So uh, tile mill can be used for multiple projections, but it's optimized for making web maps, which are in this one projection, spherical mercator. Um, and yeah, question. So the describing map next below, mm -hmm. you jump down to the map uh, Yeah, so Mapnik is the renderer tool, which is also open source under the hood here which is interpreting this stuff. You can pass some commands in this Cardo editor down to Mapnik. Um, honestly, I'm not too familiar with the multi-projection support. I can point you to some maps afterwards, and as well as connect you to the, the, my coworkers who made them, who can answer those questions better. But I know it can be done. Um, yeah, so just as an example to show you this tabular kind of data, if I go back to the country's properties, uh, say I only want to color uh, Argentina. So Argentina has a due to shape files, it's got a column name called geo unit. That's just what they decided to call it. So in my countries here, I can say geo unit equals Argentina, and thereby qualify everything in the brackets. And when I save that, it only colors in Argentina in black and yellow. So you can do some kind of advanced things. Um, you can also do um, pattern matching and, and reg regex on you know, countries that have G as the third letter, things like that. But at a basic level, this is how you can uh, kind of target various parts of your map. And this works for points and lines as well. Yeah? Can you manipulate, um, like, your GeoJSON or something um, in this, or have it reload automatically if you're? Um, if you change the data files, you'll have to, you have to blow it away out of the cache on disk. Um, this puts, puts stuff in, in essentially your home folder uh, underneath Documents, uh, Mapbox. And then there's a project folder and a cache folder in there. You can blow that away. Um, a fictional map. Yeah. Um, this has been used for some fictional maps as well, so it can be done. Uh, it works better at a local level because if it's not a full, pla uh, a full planet map, things start to get wonky. This is really designed for the, the full Earth, but um, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the basic of editing and targeting. Uh, so I'm going to switch over to the one I have prepped of the food carts, and I've got pretty much all the stuff um, commented out. So what I do have in here is TriMet rail lines. Um, and so we did 
Yeah. Right now, no Correct. Yeah, and then I just zoomed in. You can go in in the preferences of uh, up here in this little wrench. You can kind of shift drag to draw the area you want to consider. And it helped once I had some bearings, like in this case TriMet, so I could see where I wanted to zoom in. You might want to add states or something like that, and color in Oregon, so that you can figure out how to zoom in. You can also just specify a latitude and longitude and a zoom level of where you want the center of this map to be when you load it up. Um, but what I've got essentially is a rail, uh, a rail shape file, and I'll show you the edit for the layer. This is sitting on my des desktop in a folder called Map Data. And I just pulled it down from TriMet's developer site. Oops. Uh, I called it rail up in the ID, and I saved it, and I browsed it on my file system right like this, just going in, in on here. And then once it's in here, I can target it with pound rail. I give it a line width of 2. I could also equally do 20, which looks terrible. But um, you can do things like uh, line joins and line, the ends of lines, whether they're rounded or squared or beveled and things like that. Um, and I used a hex code in this case. And there's a cool trick if you've, if you've typed in a hex code you, all the hex codes that you've used appear in this bottom bar down here. Um, and you can click on them and use a color picker uh, to change them on the fly if you want. So I could change it to more of a reddish and hit save. And then it's a red line. I'm going to, oops, I'm going to change that back. Because um, I like the gray. And I'm just going to start adding a couple other layers. So this one, being a line shape file, shows up with a little line icon in the layers palette. Let me check my time real quick. Uh, and then, um, so I'm using the line symbolizer, line width and line color. And once again, these brackets kind of bring up the reference for that. So you can go to line and see what kinds of things you can do with lines. Um, so I'm going to add a couple more layers here. I'm going to browse, go to my desktop, map data, um, rail stops. Grab that guy. I believe I called that stops. And then down in my pre-made Cardo code, I have it somewhere, stops. And while the ordering down here matters as to what's on top of what, the order in your code does not matter, other than later things take precedence if you're styling the same section, similar to the way CSS works, the way it cascades. So my stops, <coughs> my stops are points indicated by a little dot. There's a, a marker width. I'm just not even going to, you could import an image if you wanted to put a pin image or something like that. But I'm just doing a generic round marker, which, by the way, you could change the shape as well. Um, and I'm allowing them to overlap if they're very close and giving that a color as well, similar to my other color. So now I've got all the stations for TriMet on the lines for TriMet um, laid on top. I could reorder them if I wanted to put them under like that, although you can't see because they're the same color. So um, something like that. Uh, so now I'll add a layer for desktop map data. Let's do... I thought I had a land one. I think I used the generic land one. Let me see here. Oops, that's no, physical. Yeah. Land from that box. Call that land. Save that out. Grab my land guy here. And if you're not familiar with, this is just inline commenting similar to C or PHP, where it's slash, asterisk, and then at the end, asterisk, slash. I've got all my stuff as a cheat sheet down here, commented out, and I'm just scrolling down, copying it, bringing it up, and uncommenting it. Um, land. So to start simply, you could just give it a fill and an opacity. So I've given it a certain hex color, which shows up down at the bottom again, and then an opacity of 0.25. And there's some neat stuff you can do with um, polygon pattern file and bring a file in and, and uh, give it some texture. So also in here, I've got some. Um, Images, I think I used, I'm looking at it, uh, masonry, kind of a concrete -y feel. Just this uh, JPEG that I grabbed online. Is that the one I used? Yeah. So I bring that in, reference that, give it some opacity, and now it's got a little bit of texture. It might be a little hard to see on there, but it's kind of a masonry. Again, it's because I've got a very, very light application of it, 10% opacity. I could crank that up if you wanted to see it way high, and it just becomes. And again, now land is on top. I want that to be underneath. Hit save there. Not a great combo because we have gray trimet lines, but I'll put it back to 0.1, say. This ends up looking good in the end. Something more like that. And add another layer. I've got uh, map data. Uh, let's do, yeah, water bodies is pretty cool. You need the Willamette River in there. So um, 
This one I grab, I think I just called it water. So why is it just not, it doesn't include that post and stuff? I mean, including. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not, it's, it's not counting the oceans. Yeah. It's basically the continents, yeah. Um, as pulled down from that source. Uh, so water I've got. This one starts to look really cool. So this guy, we'll get rid of the pattern for a minute. This one's a little bigger, so it takes a minute. That's my water on top. So let me put that on top of the land, but under the TriMet stuff. So it's got a dark blue border, which is this guy aligned with the one, which you, know, you can adjust on the fly kind of deal. And then a light blue, fully opaque interior. And then the cool thing I did was grab this tiled image and bring that over with an opacity of 25, and then I have a sweet looking river. river. Make it a little darker for a minute to see it on the projector, but it makes it look kind of cool. So you can do some pretty neat stuff in real time. Um, this does work at the world level. As you can imagine, like I pulled in all the water bodies in Oregon, so if I were not zoomed in, it would take a little while for the thing to refresh after I applied a texture to all that. Um, there are ways. Oh, I didn't show you QGIS. Let me show you that. So one of the ways, if you go into something like the water bodies download, shape files have a bunch of other files that come with them, but they're basically this .shp file. And I've got those set up to open in QGIS by default on my machine. Um, this Oregon water beta, is that something that was also in the thing including That one was not at a state level. I grabbed this. I mentioned this in the sources file. I grabbed this from Civic Apps a while ago. It's no longer on there, so I had to provide it myself. But it, I, I mentioned who it's licensed from. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think I credit one source to that as well, or via Civic Apps, yeah. But if, if it's R, RLIS, yeah. If you just search for you know, Oregon or Portland or whatever city GIS data, you turn up a lot of things. Um, so you can kind of see the outline of Oregon State here. This is a rather complex shape file. Um, just zooming in, it kind of takes a while to do stuff. But this is all the water in Oregon as tracked by the state. So you can imagine they're pretty detailed. So, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is brought over, and then I'm just styling. The part you can see in this map is the Willamette, so I'm giving that a styling here. But, um, yeah, if I zoom out, uh, you can see a lot more. It just gets a little more tricky to render. Um, so then let's add streets, desktop. Streets, this came from the city uh, of Portland. I called this streets, funnily enough. Save that out. That I will put under the rail, but on top of the water and the land. And then I got to style it. So streets. And I should mention for organizational purposes, you can make multiple style sheets. They're all just kind of concatenated together if you want to separate out labels from, or polygons from lines or things like that. This is short enough, I kind of do it in one. But you can see some of the demo projects that ship with Tomo can get kind of large. So this one is all the streets in Portland. Now it starts to get interesting. Um, I've got the minimum zoom set to 14, so I can't zoom out right now. But let me slide that up to like maybe 11 and then zoom out. You can start to see. But it's still doing it real time. It's pretty commendable, but it doesn't look as great up at the top either. It's, I'm really kind of focusing on the Willamette because I'm doing downtown. But, um, oops. Yeah, so now I've got all the streets. I've given a line width, the line color, a little bit of faded opacity on them. They're not, they're not as important for a food cart map. Um, they're in the right order. So let's grab um, water bodies. So businesses. So next to your cart. Well, let me. I'll do carts next. So the carts is a KML file, and this is like I mentioned. I grabbed from the um, the map at foodcartsportland.com. Um, it essentially just you know, it's XML. It's point data XML in this case. Um, and it refers to some remote images. But um, so if I add in carts XML, I don't have to tell it what type it is. If it's a supported tile mill type, it just kind of grabs it. Call it carts. Save it out. Grab my carts Cardo code. And this one I've done, again, generic markers, a little bit wider than, say, my TriMet stations, which are eight pixels. This is 15. It's got a fill color, allowed to overlap. They've got opacity. So there's all my food carts on the map. 
Nah. What's that? Yeah, if you turn off allow overlap, any that are next to each other just get obliterated. So for something like this where the point is mapping every cart, even though it looks a little cluttered, um, I want to have that on, but in certain cases you just want to, you don't want to, like, you can set rankings and things so that if uh, a, a street name comes in contact with a the edge of a river name or something like that, you kind of set precedence. But in this case, I just want to over allow them all to overlap. In the case of TriMet stations, even when I zoom out, they overlap a little bit too, so I've got that turned on in that layer as well. Uh, okay, and then um, let me add app data. So business licenses. This is a CSV file that also came from Civic Apps. Um, it's got every business license in the city. And, I, and I, rather than, since it's CSV, which is just text, it's, it's what you could get from a spreadsheet export. Um, looks kind of like this, which is even large to preview. I decided to cut it down a bit since it's not a very optimal querying format, and I just used grep on it to get only the banks. I basically filtered it. Even that one's kind of large. Yeah, I filtered the data on having this NAICS description of commercial banking. So I weeded out all the liquor stores and everything else and just went with banks. And so I'll add that file, banks.csv, call it banks, save it. I will put that under the carts. It's a little less important. And I can also browse that tabular data right here so you can get an idea of the things you could use. If you wanted to use labels, I could use the business name here or the date it was added or other things like that, the zip code. Um, Um, for CSV, I believe you have to call it latitude and longitude. Yeah, the other things being natively geo formats, like KML and everything, it knows how to parse. Um, this one, I'm pretty sure you have to call it latitude and longitude. Uh, yeah, that's probably the simplest way to do it. I'm sure there's a way to code it differently if you've got, but it's text so you can kind of manipulate it anyway. Um, and so that's my banks block. Grab those guys, put those in here. So these, I'm going to do some simple labeling. I didn't get into labeling because this is really kind of a high-level overview and labeling can get complicated, but I'm using a literal dollar sign instead of pulling some data out of the rows here just to show them as green dollar signs on the map. I'm essentially saying these are going to be where you can find your ATMs. So I use a font for that, and I give it a little white halo. So without the halo, I just get green dollar signs, but I can add a halo radius and a halo fill of white, and then I get green dollar signs with little white halos around them, so a little easier to see but they are under the, the food carts. So like in this case, you can see it being underneath the food cart um, or disappearing entirely. So there's our ATM locations. And I think I've only got a couple left. Oh, parks. I forgot parks. Parks looks good. Banks really have pillows. <laughs> <laughs> so, so map data, I'll grab my parks, which again is a Portland data set. Call it parks. Save that guy out. This one I do similarly, I put a cool texture on it. Before I was making maps that were just colors and I realized textures look really cool. So I've just, this is my first map with textures. Um, so by default, if I just have a fill opacity of this, this color of one and a line width on it, all the parks show up. And so you can see like the North Park blocks, South Park blocks, the Riverfront Park. They're on top right now, so they're covering up some of our carts, which doesn't make any sense. So I'm gonna stick the carts over land and water, under the streets, because sometimes streets cross parks. Save that guy out. Now the, well, yeah. now the parks are underneath. Um, and then if I add, I've got a cool texture. This, oops, not that. This grass texture, which is infinitely tileable. So bring that over, bring in a polygon pattern file. And I gave it some opacity, like 0.25. You could do one, which makes it quite dark. But yeah, but yeah I think that looks pretty cool. It's a nice texture to it. So you can also, also full screen your map, particularly useful when you're in a small monitor like this. You just want to kind of get a sense of what your map's looking like. Zoom out a little, check it out. This one's not made for the macro scale, so the dots are a little large for this zoom level. You can do things conditionally based on what zoom level you're on or turn things off on certain zoom levels. That's all in the Cardo reference as well. I'm not going to get into that too much. But. You, for the, the conditionals, you have to do, for zooms, you have to do the zoom level. And for other things, like when I showed the filling in Argentina, you can do literals based on tabular data from your layers. So you can say, 
only show me the food carts that start with T or have tie in the name or something like that. Or only show food carts once we're at zoom 15 or greater, which is what we're on right now. And then when you zoom out here, um, actually I could show you that real quick. If I unfull screen the map, take my carts, do zoom greater than or equal to 15. Oops, it's got a syntax highlighter for bad syntax. Do that, now we're at zoom 15 up here. If I zoom out, carts disappear once it reaches, gets out of cache. Um, but yeah, so carts don't appear in any of the higher zoom levels. We'd probably do the same for banks and stuff like that. But, um, I'll put them back on. Did I see a question a second ago? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, question is, could you hide less important streets at the lower zoom levels? Going to the streets layer, if I look at the tabular data, it's got, I mean, this particular data set has its length in meters, it has its name, its type, street av, that kind of thing. Uh, I don't know if this has any kind of ranking. It shows what zip code it starts and ends in, what county it's in, when it's updated, but... Yeah, this particular data set doesn't have any kind of relevant stuff like that. A lot of the things you'll get from that natural earth data set, which is our online version, like for country names or capitals, it'll delineate capitals, major cities, minor cities, towns, things like that. And there's, a, there's a whole art to really categorizing this. There's a, yeah, freeways and highways and things like that. You could do it by pattern matching or find a data set that has a qualification. Uh, and yeah, I think I've got one more layer, and then I'm technically out of time, although I think it's a tea break next, so let me put that in. Uh, the, oh, so the GitHub repo has this Cardo CSS file to paste in as well as all these data sources to download, either links to them off of GitHub or hosted right on GitHub. Let me add the last layer real quick and then I'll wrap up. And uh, I'm happy to take questions afterwards though. So. Last one is the biggest, kind of heaviest one. It's all the buildings in Portland. It's kind of a large data set, but it looks awesome. So you know, another way for building data is portlandmaps.com or portlandmaps.org. It's the city of Portland's like official GIS. Yeah. It has tax data and everything. Yeah, it's some good stuff. Um, that's kind of a more advanced issue. I can show you some things on that, and I'm by no means an expert on that, but labels overlap, and that, that becomes a real problem, so I can show you some tricks for that. This is the buildings data set. Um, this takes a minute to render because it's, I don't know how many, I think it's 600,000 buildings because it's the whole metro area. But is there, is there an easy way to make it that certain attributes of like the building, not, you, you, obviously you can make it so that the buildings just don't at all render below a certain level, but you, yep. can you make it like that their properties are different at zoom level 8 than they are at zoom level 9. That you usually do in your data. So with something like QGIS, you can open up the data and simplify it or do other things and then use two different data sets. So you pull in one for higher zoom levels or one for lower zoom levels. There's, there, I think there are some advanced options for like simplifying polygons and things like that right in Cardo. I'm not familiar with them off the top of my head, but um, let me wrap this up real quick and I'll, I'll show you some examples of it afterwards. This one I just put a stripey kind of pattern in and gave it a bit of a, of a tint. So basically our map looks like this all said and done. A little busy, I mean the building's kind of, but it looks kind of cool at the local level because it's, um, it's got a cool sketch to it and uh, yeah. So just to go back to this for a minute, oops. So in conclusion, open source tool chain, all this stuff is available on open source. We've kind of solved some of the portability problems with exporting. I didn't show you exporting, but it's just an export button, sends it up to Mapbox or out to an MB tiles file on the disk. Democratization of maps is at hand. This is all open source stuff. Maps are fun also. Um, thank you. Uh, you can reach me. Thanks. Thanks. You can reach me at any of these spots or come see me afterwards or the rest of the day. I'm happy to answer questions about all this. You yeah, you could. You can command line script tile mill because right. its its actual thing is an index.js that's right. being spun up and starting an HTTP server. But you can use it with command line arguments to do an export or do other things. So you could you could technically assemble this style file from data. So it could all be scripted. Yeah, well, why yeah. Yeah, like if you already got the style down or something yeah. and you've worked out those tweaks visually, you could code that into a script yeah, so that like, just churns the stuff out. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Have you heard of yeah. um, open paths? 
Open pads? No. So you see now that it oh, just kind of, with really low battery usage, tracks where I've been. Mm -hmm. I just have it constantly running in the background. I hadn't noticed cool. a battery change. It just, it just um, skims off whatever G GPS usage on the yeah. apps you're using. And then if you, if it hasn't, if another app hasn't opened in a while, then it'll just do it. That's cool. And turn on a little bit so it only gets like a rough GPS yeah. fix, so yeah. it doesn't use a lot of battery. Um, yeah, if you could export that in a KML or, can. yeah, then so you I've could style this, it, yeah. I've got this really, I, I don't want to zoom all the way out because it'll be massive, but, I mean, I, over the last year I've been all across Canada and back and up in Yukon, and mm -hmm. I think it's really cool having this whole thing that yeah. I'd like to make it into some sort of, like, output, some sort of artistic printout that I can yeah. do, or yeah. that'd be really cool to have, like, a laser cut out on a paper, or do some sort of art product. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend for making that happen? Um, like yeah, if you get that into KML or some other kind of format, you could, we've done a lot of visual, more artistic side visualizations with Tom Mill as well. Um, uh, you, can, you can do, there's a lot of things like Gaussian blurs and some higher, like more Photoshop-y type or GIMP type of uh, image processing effects you can do on the markers and lines and the other symbolizers in Tom Mill. So you can start to do some really interesting things. Not just tiling, but also just printouts. Um, yeah, we have some guides on that. It's, it's not designed for it, but there's lots of people have done it, and we've got some guides on how to, what, how to go about doing that. You kind of pick a zoom level and you kind of run with it. Is this recommended, or is there another program that is designed for that? Um, recommended for that? No, I'm not familiar. I'm sure there's other ones that would work for that sort of thing. Um, this would I'm more familiar. Yeah, this would work. We've had people do printouts with this kind of sort of thing before. This is, this is an example of a little more... Um, when it loads, I think the data source is around. This is doing some interesting things with the country's layer and doing a, a stack blur on the borders. Why is it not loading up? It might be a remote data source that I'm not connected to right now. But you can see from the preview right here what it looks like. It's kind of a fuzzy border on the country. It's not really doing it justice to see it like that. But you can, you can do some interesting things. Yeah, I'm missing some data files for some of these projects because they're not, they're not local. But you can do a fair amount of kind of high-end processing on this. Actually, I can send you or show you a link afterwards. Um, of some ones that we've done. We did a blog post on doing some stuff like that, but yeah. 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 So hey. like, does Tamil specifically block me from installing on Ubuntu 13.04? Hmm. Is there anything fundamentally incompatible about it? Or just no. Like, um, I got a 12.04 VM and installed in time. My feed yeah, um, interesting. It just said raring is not supported. What is not supported? Raring, which R is raring when they all the, the version of Ubuntu. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, no, I'm not familiar. There was some Chromium stuff that wasn't up for yeah, it's V8. Node is V8 based. So it runs on V8, and, and that's based on Chromium. Yeah, and maybe I there's. Same, I had the same issue with, um, with just standard, like Google Chrome. Yeah. Use Chromium, but not 